Hey, I'm pleased to have uh, Walter Oseka here. Uh, thanks for joining me. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so please, uh, you're actually in uh, in in Sweden. Yeah, Stockholm, Sweden. Stockholm, Sweden, and uh, you're a MD, medical doctor, as well as a PhD. I understand it, and you're at the uh, Stress Research Institute at Stockholm University. That's right, and at uh, Karolinska Institute at the med school too. Oh, okay, the medical school too. Uh, can you give me a little bit of an introduction about yourself? Maybe your background, a little bit about uh, you know what kind of work you're doing. I see you're uh, working in uh, neuro, see neuropsychiatric and cardiovascular measures in childhood and adulthood. Uh, Here's some of your research. Yeah, that's right. Well, so I've been working as a cardiologist for a um, couple of years, cardiac rehab, but also emergency care. And I got interested in this heart and mind interaction. A lot of the cardiac patients have anxiety and depression. And you have also a lot of such risk factors as hostility. If you have a lot of that feelings, you have an increased risk of myocardial infarction. So I started to investigate that, but uh, I also met several researchers who said, well, that's not, not that new. We should look at children. How is it in children? So my, my thesis was on psychological health in children, healthy children, and the, the relation to cardiovascular measures. And we saw that if you have a lot of anger and anxiety and depression, you have already in, in young age uh, impaired uh, vascular function, which is a risk factor for later cardiac disease. So I was, uh, follow up this research, and uh, we're preparing studies in children interventions, stress reduction uh, interventions, mindfulness inter uh, interventions. But I also see stress patients nowadays, not cardiac patients anymore, but more burnout patients with a lot of yeah, empathy fatigue or what you call it, and uh, how to get them back to work. And we, we study them with fMRI and that kind of stuff. So that's short what I do. But why I started with this compassion thing, it was I was invited to Stanford to see care by my mentor Arthur Sion and I met all those wonderful scientists there uh, with Jim Doty and uh, others and uh, also Dalai Lama two years ago and I was so inspired and a couple of friends of mine we started to work for a similar center at the uh, University of Karolinska Institute in Stockholm and we've been working for that uh, center for two years now. Oh, okay so um, you were inspired by uh the Sea Care Center for Compassion Altruism Research at uh, Stanford. Yeah. And, um, but also Paul Gilbert's work and other work oh. and Christian Neff and a lot of other people will be readers. But that was the first, for me, sparkle. <laughs> it uh -huh. was possible to do it. It's really the, the power of, of this center was quite yeah, impressive. Uh, so you have a whole team there that you're bringing together, building a whole center there to kind of explore kind of the... Uh, uh, how to foster compassion and exactly. uh -huh. at an individual level and group level and societal level, hopefully. Oh, how is that going? Maybe you could give a little overview of kind of how, what have you kind of done so far and what's your plans and vision for the center? Yeah, we have had like um, several seminars inviting researchers from uh, different places, universities in Sweden, to yeah map the research research going on and a lot of people want to do re research together with us and we are now really looking at the best place to be in um, and the vision is to do collaborative work with uh, engineers uh, psychologists and uh, yeah that is true but also with the uh, volunteers uh, in order to as I said map um, not now the researchers but which areas we should uh, focus on. And oh. one, friend, one of my friends, she has been working really a lot with that, Christina Anderson. She has uh, translated a program and also developed it together with uh, her colleague, Sofia. And they are giving compassion-focused training now for the first time in Sweden. And they're preparing other studies. 
Oh, so when, when you say a map, is that does that mean kind of lay out? What are the different uh, approaches to fostering, I guess, empathy and compassion and kind of get an overview and then you're wanting to look yeah. at kind of what your area of specialty will be that exactly. your center will focus on? Exactly. We had one day now at the Karolinski Institute in September where we invite a lot of different research groups and we're now doing a special edition for a magazine with those uh, lectures uh, as a start, uh, yeah, platform. Okay, and then you mentioned compassion-focused therapy uh, with Paul Gilbert. I just interviewed yeah. him, just uh, yeah. uploaded that recently. So there's a whole community uh, around uh, that that process. Yeah, he, uh, I just we have been aware of. him, and he has been to Stockholm, and he has really been supportive. So yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. So, so you're saying that your personal studies, though, have been about uh, uh, about uh, stress and the cardiovascular. So it's like the effect of uh, stress on the body, yeah. and I guess you're looking at how compassion affects that. How compassion can be used to reduce stress and and therefore improve your exactly. your physical health. Exactly. So until now, we have more looked at. Uh, the bad sides of stress and uh, on and vascular function and so but uh, the next uh, the following step should be to focus on interventions which are more focused for, uh, on compassion i think that I, should, I think that is more powerful than just mindfulness so if you tailor it and uh, go for the self compassion training and there also compassion towards others i think that's really the pow most powerful thing but that has to be pr uh, tested of course in different in different populations and at different doses and um, yeah all that. Uh huh. So you really want to do it scientifically? Do some studies sure. and have the uh, you know how what is the effectiveness and have your studies to uh, back up the, the those that yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I've been uh, what we have here is the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. So my focus has a bit been a bit more on the uh, empathy. Uh, area and you know you're talking a lot about the compassion and I'm wondering what is the how are you seeing the definitions of empathy and compassion I mean is, is before we really get into this well um, I know this discourse about uh, empathy as uh, ability as ability to understand other people's feelings and uh, I go quite along with Kristin Neff there that yes, there could be a difference between empathy and compassion, and compassion is the next step that you really want to do something for someone else. And empathy is just the ability, ability and you could use it for good and for bad. Uh, you can really manipulate people. But then you go to autistic people, and they are said that they have a, well, dysfunctional empathy yeah, ability, but they can be really compassionate. That's really puzzling me. That, I think, should be investigated much more. So I think there is a uh, difference. And also Tanya Singer sh says that there are different connectivity circuits in, in the brain when you look at just empathy and then the next step, compassion. And I think that needs much more studying. Yeah, well, there's, uh, you know, I've been looking at this for, you know, some time now, and, and the academics are all over the place themselves in terms of these definitions, and, you know, I've talked uh, with uh, uh, Dan Batson, who kind of laid out some of the ways that the word empathy is used, and he's said here are at least eight ways, and there's probably more, that the word is actually used, and he was saying if you have a conversation, the only thing you can do is first define your terms and then stick with it and be clear about it. So uh, that, and then I've talked to people like uh, Marco Iacoboni, who wrote the book Mirroring People, you know, uh, about mirror neurons. And he's saying there's a need for the academics or some scholar to get together to really put all these pieces together in a very, you know, very uh, more systematic or, uh, you know, overview, uh, you know, of of what the definitions are. So it's still, there's still a lot of uh, kind of confusion and disagreements and, uh, you know, uh, about these terms. Yeah, but you, I think you heard my definition. I think it's quite, I go along with uh, Tanya Singer and Kristin F, but also the Kristin F question mark about autistic people, for instance. 
-hmm. They might have uh, problems to understand other feelings as we see it, but they can be really compassionate. In, oh, I uh, see. So, uh -huh. so that's, I think it's really interesting. And there is research front your line. Uh, we don't know how to uh, talk about it yet, but if we uh, continue to study it, I think we can be, be more and more precise. Mm -hmm. Well, I can just mention you know, how I'm using the term. Um, uh, for me, I use the, the, the term empathy as kind of four parts, kind of general parts. Uh, the first part is self-empathy, which is sensory awareness, mindfulness of what's going on inside of myself, you know, kind of my felt feelings and uh, kind of that sensory awareness and mindfulness kind of comes in there as well to be aware of what's going on inside myself. Uh, the second part would be a mirrored empathy, which is as I see you, I can see your head slightly tilted, mm -hmm. you know, mirror neurons on my body is simulating, you know, the, the, and I see you smile, and you see my hands waving, so we're kind of, you, we're kind of mirroring each other's uh, 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 movements, uh, emotions, and intentions, too. We can get a kind of a sense of each other's intentions as well. So that's kind of the mirror neuron. Uh, mirrored empathy. Uh, the third part is, uh, I'm calling it imaginative empathy, uh, but the academics are calling it, I mean, a lot of call it like perspective taking or cognitive empathy. And that's where that we can imagine ourselves in someone else's uh, situation, kind of like an actor does, right? I can imagine you're in Stockholm, uh, you know, it's I can imagine, you know, you're in an academic institute, what it must be like, you know, to be in an academic institute, uh, and, you know, just your whole kind of background. And so kind of taking that, uh, you know, that kind of comes in with self-awareness uh, as we are, see ourselves as separate beings, we can kind of put ourselves in the shoes of others. And uh, then the fourth part is uh, empathic action or empathic creativity or even an empathic arising, which is as we get connected with each other, you know, deeply we see each other's uh, deeper feelings, emotions, uh, and intentions that we want to, we're, we're kind of as human beings, we want to contribute to each other's well-being. And uh, that we just naturally do things that will contribute to each other's well-being and uh, out of that common humanity, so those other processes have, have us see our common humanity, our common feelings, and we have that uh, kind of that empathic creativity that kind of comes out of that. Now that's kind of like the basic process. And then the other is um, how, how does compassion, for me, compassion is that process, but applied to suffering. Now I can empathize with your joy, with your creativity, with your, with your, um, you know, any, the whole spectrum of your feelings and experiences, but compassion is that slice which is uh, directed towards uh, somebody's suffering or pain or suffering, and how do you interact uh, in that? So there would be a self-compassion, a mirrored compassion, you know, an imaginative compassion and a compassionate action, you know, kind of paralleling that. So that's kind of like the model that I'm using. I'm just wondering how that kind of resonates with your understanding and fits in yeah. with your kind of model. Yeah. I haven't um, limited it to just suffering. I know that, for instance, the, the Dalai Lama also says that it's so much about uh, elevating others, other suffering. Uh, but uh, I think it would also be really interesting to look if there is a difference, a difference between uh, feeling this empathic thing towards people suffering and if they have joy and if there, if this is really a, 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 a neurophysiological specific thing, that would be of interest. Otherwise, I think compassion could also be that you feel with others joy. I don't think that it's a that's, that's a problem. I, I could say that uh, just that you feel compassion with, towards others, uh, whatever they feel. I, I don't think that the, just the suffering is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's my reaction to it. Oh, okay, I, so I, you're, I never, you have I a never, kind of, oh, sorry. I never heard that kind of uh, explanation before. Now, I, I have heard the, the four steps, but the third step would be empathy and the fourth would be compassion for me. 
So the quite broad compassion, not just to, towards suffering. Yeah, well, that's the. Uh, I mean, that's where the the lack of clarity comes in within yeah, the yeah. with the whole so area. Yeah. Is people are are talking about the same phenomenon, but using different terms. Because I'm what I'm hearing you say is what I'm calling empathic action or empathic creativity. You're calling that uh, compassionate action, right? You're calling yeah. that kind of like compassion. So it's just like it's the same phenomenon, but it's like we're mm -hmm. kind of using different uh, terminology around it, and it creates. I mean, it creates, I mean, to create a movement, we want to have a movement to foster empathy and compassion yeah, within yeah. society. It would be really nice. I mean, you're, as a doctor, you know, you don't want to be in the operating room, you know, you're saying, give me a scalpel and somebody sent, gives you a pair of scissors or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it'd be nice to have some clarity about these yeah, terms. I do agree. So, yeah, so anyway, that's something to be, uh, I think, is going to be a long-term process of having these yeah. dialogues, you know, kind of yeah. come up with. That, that. I can tell you, my tradition is coming from a psychiatric uh, school also, that's much more empathic action could all actually be the psychopath or sociopath uh, being really clever at empathy and doing actions, but they are bad. They are manipulative and so. So therefore, I have this kind of background. Right. But I understand exactly what you say. Yeah, it's, it's that whole notion, uh, I hear that come up a lot uh, about, uh, you know, the torturer needs to empathize with, mm -hmm. the, uh, with their victim. The used car salesman needs to empathize with the mm -hmm. person they want to sell this junk car to. And the psychopath needs to empathize, uh, you know, is, is trying to understand the, the other person so that they can manipulate them more effectively, like that. Mm. Is that what you're kind of speaking yeah, to? Is yeah. that, uh, um, and then how does that relate? Uh, you know, there's uh, people like um, uh, Simon Baron Cohen, I don't know if you've, uh, you know, his, his book, The uh, End of Evil, I have it up there, The Science of Evil, and he's, he says, by definition, empathy, uh, the, the psychopath is not empathizing. Uh, I guess it's like how do you kind of tease that out, right? That differentiation. You're saying it's a sense of saying that the psychopath is using empathy and then they're doing unempathic things. It's kind of, like, and I would say it's maybe something like the um, you know the Nazi prison guard in the in the concentration camp. They're doing these horrible things to somebody, but then they go home. And then they love their dog, they love their cats, I mean, they love their children, love their wife and their friends, but they do the most horrible things in the prison camp, right? So does, and because they're having empathy and compassion, you know, with their family, does that mean that that's bad because they're having it, uh, you know, they're doing these terrible things? It, it's like, I would say it's kind of like that, the psychopath is not doing full compassion or empathy. You know, it's not being no, fully no one, empathic. No one is doing full compassion. <laughs> no Sorry. <one. laughs> I don't know who that should be. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's like, uh, you know, Simon Baron Cohen has a scale. He's, you know, he's talking about a scale of empathy. So that we're, like you're saying, we can be low on the empathy scale or high. And it, we, it's... Uh, it's kind of a scalable. I think that's what you're addressing. Is that right? That nobody's doing I'm addressing that. Fully. Yeah, I'm addressing that. I think also Baron Cohen is an autism researcher, and he says that autistic people don't have empathy, and they maybe don't have compassion. I think also Kristen Neff talked with him about that, and my impression is that well, you could. It's good to be have this. I said it before. You could be empathic. You could uh, understand other people's uh, understand other pe people's feeling, uh, but then you could use it in different ways. Autistic people might not uh, have this good ability in empathy to really uh, go with this, yeah, theory of mind and uh, understand other people. But they could be really kind and compassionate anyway, and that's uh -huh. something new, which I don't know if that if Baron Cohen understands or has. Uh, thought about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's that someone well, may not asking. be able to empathize, but they can be warm uh, towards others. 
and really yeah warm hearted and and they were have really could have really good uh, intentions and they want to give care and be kind and so but they might not understand the uh, other people's feelings so good oh i see uh so there's that 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 compassion that care it's like an innate kind of quality and even yeah. if you can't read someone else you're still wanting to have that yeah that uh, capacity you still want to contribute somehow to them yeah. And I, I think that's not just for autistic people. I think most of us have a lot of good intention and we don't really understand uh, the other person's need. So that's why we need those dis discussions. How could I be most compassionate towards you so that you uh, get, are getting the best benefit of it? I have to know you better and better. Oh, so okay. I think uh -huh. the best way of to be compassionate and also the hardest way is in close relationships. If you are really close and you know the other person really well then you could be really compassionate but also that's the most hard part almost. Yeah. I don't know, it's, it's sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's like personal relationships. I know it from my partner too. It's like your family and friends and you know, you get it somehow. It's like it's the hardest at that point. Yeah. But it then, could be more, yeah, so. it could be more easy to go to Africa and be kind a couple of years or months, and then go back. Just be the good guy. But then you, if you're in a close relationship, all of your personality sides of your personality are disclosed, and yeah, you have to work with a lot of more things. Yeah. So what what have you found for having what's the? I mean the the. The, uh, what I'm really looking at is how do we build a culture of empathy and compassion, right? It's like how do we foster empathy and compassion in, in society? And uh, that's kind of like a problem right there. How do you do it in your family? You know, how do you do it in all kinds of environments? And so what have you found for like the best uh, strategy or the best uh, intervention or the best approach to foster, foster empathy and compassion? Well, to allow me to be vulnerable, to, to be weak, that's really tough. But really to not just shut down the feelings and so. And I think one of the starters is mindfulness. It's really helpful. And then also include uh, kindness, loving kindness, meditations. I think those have been most powerful for me when I have trouble with myself and I really don't like my own behavior. It has been really helpful. But also, as you say, empathic, empathic listening, um, try to be empathic in group processes is really challenging. Uh, you know, in an academic setting, it's really competitive. That's kind of also um, an opposite force. You know, Paul Gilbert's work with, uh, it's much more easy to be compassionate if you have this soothing system up and running and you are, you are not in the fear state and so. But I think, I don't know, you know, Hemingway, I think, said something about uh, grace under pressure. That's really courage or that's, yeah. The, but the compassion under pressure, if you are not in the, this safe zone, that is really a challenge and that we should foster. and really try to be better at and that we can we can practice with with those kinds of mindfulness and compassion trainings mm. so the first thing i was hearing uh, you say it's that it's that quality of being open right it's that uh open uh, mind open heart yeah open mind open heart and it's and uh it's and you're saying that it's like uh, mindfulness has uh, is one of the processes that is to can be with, used yeah. to start with to have that mm -hmm. openness is that you know what I see I mean I can visually feel myself being open or closed right or mm -hmm. you know something causes me a bit of stress and I kind of close off and it's it's like your work with uh, stress I mean that's kind of like stress right I mean that's like when we're closing ourselves off that seems to be like a stress response that we're shutting down our feelings yeah. And that's really what you're kind of studying, isn't it? Is like that stress response of closing yeah. off versus and kind of that openness of yeah. relaxing. And, you know, what's going on in the body when we close <laughs> off like that? Well, the peripheral arteries, they're really closing down and are getting narrow because you shouldn't bleed when you have this cut in, in, if you're fighting. 
that's the physiological and the evolutionary background, I, I think. So that's really the bodily armor, and um, we can study that. And uh, also stress hormones, and you are getting more narrow, focused, uh, tunnel, what you say, sight, or what you say. Mm, and, tunnel uh, vision or focus. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. You're not, you couldn't be, you're not that creative anymore. You're more defense or attack, and it's much more, you're much more singled, single-minded. So you, you, you don't have this cognitive or emotional flexibility, which is needed in, in, in social interactions. Mm. So really, when we become stressful, we are we constrict. We're physically the the blood the uh, the uh, arteries or the blood vessels yeah. are actually yeah. physically constricting. Yeah. Our uh, awareness and our attention is focusing maybe yeah. on what the danger is. Exactly. Uh huh. And then also the uh, cognitive and emotional flexibility is going down. Oh, okay. Uh huh. So we're not able to think as create creatively. Yeah. No. at that point so and uh, that's and I guess there's that's what you're kind of studying is the stress if we're under that stress for prolonged periods of time that's having detrimental effects yes on on the cardiovascular system but also in the brain we can see changes uh, for, for like amygdala and the prefrontal cortex and the connectivity and so so if you are, you have chronic stress it's really bad for your body and your mind. And it's harder to be compassionate, I think, but, you, but we have to study that uh, more closely. Yeah, so it's really a, of, uh, of uh, how do we kind of open and kind of keep that open openness and that open-heartedness and that uh, vulnerability, I guess that's what you're calling is that vulnerability mm -hmm. Uh, and I think you can't be that open all the time. I think that's really hard at least. But if you just do something every day where you open up and you, you try to go through what happened during the day and what I could do, had done better or something, and also do a kind of open up practice, uh, uh, loving kindness meditation, I think that if you do that for a longer time, it's really beneficial for your social interactions and your relationships and also I think for your pro productivity yeah so kind of any practices that we can do to kind of uh, relax and uh, have that openness and and I mean it could be things like a massage I imagine too I mean right that's yeah, kind of, yeah, kind of yeah. there's all kinds of physical kind of processes um, well, what we're looking at, uh, perhaps you have some uh, thoughts about this, is uh, we call them empathy circles. We have small group discussions, and it's, it's based on uh, reflective listening. Like you're, you said, you're in, this, uh, uh, you know, in the, the psychology, um, I think it was department. Or, or, and, you know, the work of Carl Rogers, have you looked into that? You know, he uses, his therapy was all about reflective listening. It's just like... Mm -hmm. Um, whatever you're doing, I'm just reflecting it back to you. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. It's just so you can see yourself reflected in someone else. Have you looked into that process? Well, not exactly that process. We are a group of researchers in our little association for contemplation in uh, education and research in, in Sweden. And we are quite a few members and we do um, contemplations on our own research questions in different kinds of contemplative uh, practices, mindful walking, a contemplative inquiry, movement, and so. And then we also do reflections on that. We do, we journal what we um, envision or so, what we experience, but we also sometimes share what we uh, experience. Uh, so that is a kind of reflection but it's a quite special kind of um, contemplative practice. So you're like taking your own research and just having kind of a space to really just uh, uh, think about it and focus, kind of be mindful yeah. about it. Uh -huh. Really, really focused attention and really uh, sharpen the research question. And then we try to leave it and go into open awareness and see what 
if something just arises, a, a feeling or a picture, an image or something. And if there if there's a picture or an image, or we try to focus on that again, really sharp for a moment, and then we go up in open awareness again. So it's a focus and open up, focus mm. and open up. So that's a kind of how we work. Uh-huh. It's like you're... One of, one of the processes. Yeah. And then you're sharing that with your colleagues? Is yeah. that the idea? That... Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that's also so. a challenge because we are in a research setting. So sometimes we are quite <laughs> with our ideas. <laughs> we don't want to share them because it's, yeah, intellectual property. And yeah. So that's also something one could discuss in empathic reflections. Yeah. One way to. Sorry. One way to to bypass that could be that you maybe not focus on the content on the uh, in the meditation more uh, on the process if it was hard if it was joyful or fantastic or it was gruesome also that could be a, a solution but then it's also a bit more yeah it's not that rich anymore but it this practice really needs trust and i think also this empathic uh, reflection and so that also needs needs trust. Yeah, so the, the what is the trust part there? I, I, I hearing you're saying it. There's something about trust in this process. Is the trust with sharing with your colleagues yeah, who yeah, who might yeah. take your ideas and yeah. and or, or put yeah. you down? I mean, in academics, it's like you beat up the other guy, right? Yeah. Their ideas. Yeah. Because your ideas are better, so there's this competitive part, or they're going to take your ideas and, and build on them and get the credit for it. <laughs> right? Is that the, is that the problem with that? That's, I, that's, I, that could be one challenge. I yeah. haven't experienced, but I've done interviews, and I heard that uh, several times. That's, that's quite open and an honest answer. Uh, and also, I think your reflection groups, uh, it is... Uh, it is needed that you have to think about how much you share about your private problems and dreams and yeah yeah that openness is a real question how open and vulnerable mm. you want to be and it's been a real topic in in mm. our circles and especially mm. because we record them and put them out publicly and you mm. know people are crying and in tears and that's out there publicly available and yeah. so but i think there's something about that that openness you know it's that you're kind of having that courage to kind of be open and share yourself and I think it gives you a sense of uh, of uh, strength too. Yeah, I think uh, it, it depends on the context. Uh, so if you then 10 years later want to be a CEO for a big company and, and um, the hire, <laughs> hiring people see that, it depends. If it was good that you were so open with your emotions and your problems. It's really not, not an easy one. Yes, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, um, we found it's kind of like for, it's kind of with the reflective listening, it's a bit uh, like the onion, you know, the, uh, where yeah, you're yeah, peeling yeah. away, you're peeling away. But the one thing that we have in the, it's not just let's get, you know, more intimate. The intention, we also set the intention. I don't know if you've looked into the nature of intention, but we start every circle off with our intention is to build a culture of empathy. And that means to foster empathy within ourselves, within the group, uh, and within society at large. So it's a very much of a, a movement building uh, process. And that means uh, empathy within, you know, changing the, uh, the social structure, the social, uh, the laws, the, the social organization, so, that, so it actually will become, uh, will foster empathy and compassion. And how does it work so far? Um, we've done maybe about uh, 16, 17 uh, of these circles, and we're, you know, you just signed up there. You saw we mm -hmm. had like 60. I, I'm really curious, yeah. But yeah, we had 60, 70 people now who have signed, who are interested. It's way beyond the capacity that, you know, I'm, I'm working with um, uh, Lidavai uh, Niesink. She has a PhD in empathy and altruism in, in Holland, so we're working as a as a team on developing this process. So we have kind of more people interested in it uh, than we have capacity right now. But we're kind of building up the capacity 
And it's really, it's a, a very beautiful, you know, it's a very beautiful relationships are, are being developed. I mean, it, almost in every circle, somebody's breaking down in tears, you know, with, in terms of, uh, you know, just kind of really sharing deep, deeper and deeper parts of ourselves. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm like super excited. I've actually, all my work is kind of, cha is being focused now on developing these circles. And uh, Lidavai actually is going to be presenting at the, uh, the, uh, the Empathy and, and Compassion London. Society conference in, in London. Yeah. yeah, so she's on a panel with uh, uh, Jim Doty. So, um, I, think we'll be, I, I think we'll be at the same panel, actually. Oh, really? Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so she's going to be present. She has a 10-minute you know, or something talk and then be maybe in the same panel. So she'll kind of go into more depth. And so she's working on the scientific, you know, the studies, you know, to, to put them together uh, for this. So... Um, but it's pretty much based on, you know, the work of Carl Rogers and, and uh, you know, his reflective listening as the foundation. And then we've gone into that imaginative empathy. So we're working on a, um, a user guide and we were doing role playing that we all acted as the user guide. And then we spoke as the user guide, like I was saying, oh, I'm the user guide and, you know, I'm not being, nobody's paying attention to me. And then somebody would reflect that, and uh, so we're adding that uh, imaginative empathy component within reflective listening uh, to it too. And that was like it's just it's really fun. I mean, it's just it's very playful, and so that's worked well. And then we do a physical mirroring too, like you know we do some mindfulness, and then you find an emotion, that, uh, a feeling that you tap into, and then you you create a physical. Uh, movement like this would be a movement kind of an energetic movement and then everybody mirrors your movement mm. until you feel fully seen and fully reflected so it's really about the synchronization you know getting into that emotional contagion that emotional synchronization uh, component so we're taking it into the phys physical realm as well so um, yeah, so and then it's just kind of the foundation to keep adding other layers on top of this. And these are ongoing groups, hopefully, that go on indefinitely, you know, every week for uh, two hours. So okay. um, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. So we, we hope to kind of create a whole series and create a whole infrastructure to support these groups on, on, on uh, Skype. Sounds really interesting. And, and I know there are a lot of... Um, also, smartphone apps where you can see how many people are meditating on on the globe at one point. But this is more, I think, much more interesting because you have groups of people. That's more, much more complex, but maybe also much more uh, potential in that. Yeah, it's the uh, it's it's four to five people max. Ideal is four because everybody has a maximum involvement in okay. in that. So you want small groups so that everybody can be involved. And the way it works is I'll start talking and I talk to someone in the group and then they reflect back to me until I feel fully heard. Everything I want to say has been heard. Then it's that person's turn to talk to anyone else in the group. And the same thing happens. And it just goes back and forth like this in a reflective dialogue. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it's almost like it just slowly peels. You start developing that trust that you're talking about, the, uh, you know, that vulnerability that if you know you're heard and you don't have to compete, you know, kind of, you start opening up just mm. naturally. So mm. um, I would love to I, talk more about that too. I don't want to take up the whole time just talking about, you know, the, the circles, but, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, can add other layers and maybe some of your work might kind of fit in on, on yeah. within that. Well, uh, a coll colleague of mine, Eva Boyner Horvitz, uh, she's a researcher and uh, also dance therapist and she has also been working with actors and she has developed a contemplative practice. She, she should also talk, actually talk about that, but I can do a shorty about that. Mm -hmm. She had a sh student with like writer's block the student wasn't able to proceed proceed with her thesis writing, and Eva 
she really talk, uh, thought about what should she, she do about that. What she, how could she mentor this? And then she uh, thought about, well, that could be something in the body with movements and something is, yeah, is locked in. So she said to the student, well, why don't you take all your papers and lay them on different spots in the room, like the introduction, mythology, and, 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 and where there are really bottlenecks for your writing. Then do a kind of mindful walking or da dance around this. And the student, she, she did this, and a lot of feeling came up, feelings like self-attacking, you're stupid, you're not good enough, and that kind of thing. And it really was in the body also. It was down in your onion, onion, what you say, down, really. Mm -hmm. But it came up there du during this uh, dance movements. And she could look at it and work with it. And after that, the writer's block was gone and she could do her writing. That's quite interesting too, I think. Yeah. Um, and that, that was, yeah, kind of embodied uh, thinking, self-attacking, which was uh, made clear and aware with this practice. Yeah, it's like you really want to feel the block, right? It's yeah, like you yeah, want to yeah. you want to get into where the block is in your body yeah, yeah, yeah. and let it out, because it, it's like that constriction that you're talking about, right? That if you're constricting that 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 it's not kind of getting out and being able to manifest, and then when it comes out and you can see it, then you're more able to uh, work with it and your creativity, and that's the empathic creativity. Is that um, is that uh, when you can see the problem, your mind automatically starts solving the problem. But you have to be able to see the problem and experience the problem for the for that creativity to kind of take place. Exactly. And also the, the the physical movement to be in a process was also powerful. You're not you're not stuck. You're not uh, static. You are in a movement, and you are going somewhere. You are, that yeah, she, she's moving in the whole yeah. space and she's yeah, letting yeah, yeah. the feelings out and, and really yeah. kind of letting them move and see where they want to move in a whole. I do this freestyle dance oh, uh, nice. wow. and that's actually a real place for my emotional exploration because it's just freestyle. You do whatever you want and mm -hmm. you just follow your feelings and it really kind of releases. Um, so that would be to build a culture of empathy. You're wanting, we want to kind of to feel. We want to move, move the body with the feelings. And that's kind of like that exercise we do as well. I yeah, was that's quite similar. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it, it's getting into the embodied because we we start with meditation. It's like, what are you feeling? And then we tap into that, and then you express it just the one motion. But I think the second part to that is she was probably very alone, right? She's working on her thesis. She's like alone, and there's a lot of uh, alienation and loneliness, I would imagine. And the other part is not just to go into it, but to share it with others. Exactly. Right? It's because when you share it, there's, I've had a physical feeling. I, the feeling comes up. When I see others mirror it reflected, it's almost as like an emotional opening. You know, yeah. it almost makes me tearful to think about it because it's so beautiful mm -hmm. to, you know, to have that see yourself reflected in others and it just lets the energy kind of flow out into the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so there are several, yeah, things we have in common there with this movement, the embodied thing, and also the self-attacking and non-compassionate behavior towards yourself which should could be alleviated by training uh, and by practice and also as you say in a in a social context in a group setting with other people who are also interesting to develop this yeah so i'm really curious about your circles <laughs> 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 Good well, there. what I'm hearing there, the other part that you're talk, looking at, uh, I was hearing was the self-judgment part. Yeah. The self-attacking might be yeah. kind of like the self-judgment. Is that exactly. how you're seeing yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that sometimes could be maybe beneficial, but we do that so much. We are so 
uh, we have internalized all those uh, attacks from others and we are so good at that and that is really holding us back and by being more self-compassionate I think it could, could balance that and buffer that. Are you doing studies along that? If you're talking about constriction it seems that that self-judgment is a constricting uh, force and a stress force. This, this actually, this, this case, it's a, it's a case study and we have submitted it to a journal. We have done, a, Eva has done that mostly. Uh, but otherwise, I, I look uh, and listen to Paul Gilbert's work. He is talking a lot of, uh, about that with uh, self-attack and, and judgment and so. Uh, there should, of course, be more studies. Should be done, yeah. So what were your studies on? What are you kind of focusing on right now? I, I just want to can reiterate that, like kind of where, where do you see your work kind of going at the moment? Um, well, I'm involved in this more culture of the health project with Eva Bonin Orvitz, where uh, she, she has produced different culture packages with movie and with you you watch a movie and you reflect on the movie you do dance together you do you listen to music and other things and that is a way to go beyond the cognitive uh, uh, understanding and you can go, go through to the emotions and also come to self compassionate processes so that's um, that's quite interesting that we might scale up a bit now we're doing that in the Stockholm area and that might be it's also planned for to be made in, in, in Sweden, maybe also international. So that's one direction. Then I also try, I'm, I'm from the medical fields, so I'm good at measuring blood pressure and blood flows and that stuff. But now we're also looking more at the first person perspective. What happens inside yourself? How do you perceive different processes, meditation processes? On, and the next step could be to see what happens if you do different kinds of compassion training self-compassion training. Uh, so what I'm just writing on now it's an interview study on uh, people doing uh, those exercises, contemplative exercises uh, with their research questions and how th that impacts on their professional work and so. I'm also preparing epi epidemiological studies on mind and body practices and how they are related to medication, self-medication, uh, psychological well-being and that kind of, but also somatic diseases. That's quite, quite, kind of quite interesting. But also uh, on how we look at consciousness and how our worldview, our understanding of the human consciousness is steering our way of create sc the co school system, the, the caring system, and that's, and that kind of, that, that's more future work. But that's, I think that's really interesting. Hmm. Well, let me just see if I, uh, if I have this. One thing, maybe you could move your camera down, because we're just oh, seeing your head yeah. kind of at the, yeah, thanks. You're slowly sinking and you uh, are getting more comfortable in your chair there. So we're going to lose you under the screen. <laughs> So the first part there is you're working with uh, your colleague about how to bring people together in social contexts. Is that right? And yeah. you watch a movie together, you do a dance together. So it's kind of like the effect of bringing people together in social uh, um, social with, situations yeah. with culture activities. Different well, through activities. cultural activities. Yeah. So there's all kinds of social cultural activities, and what's the kind of like. How do you do them effectively, or or, or? they are uh, actually done by professional culture workers, artists, and musicians, and so at primary care health settings, and uh, people they are really screened for to go into that, and we measure self-assessed health before and after, and that kind of. So it's it's research too, hmm. uh, but also I am also involved in different mindfulness studies at med school to medical students and also uh, psychiatric patients and that kind of we look at sleep quality and we try to involve more and more self-compassion 
and compassion measures. But it's quite complicated. Now we use Kristen Neff's uh, self-compassion scale, for instance. We try to have one measure in different studies. Hmm. So it's uh, creating uh, scales and measurements for these different... Uh, uh, or use brush. already created measurements. Oh, use them. Uh -huh. yeah. And the other, the other study, as I understand it, was is like as people do these different uh, activities, you know, compassion or let's say empathy activities, is that there's something going on, like we're thinking about it, and that's what you're looking at is what are people thinking about the process? Was that? What they think about it, how they experience it emotionally, but also in their, yeah, in their body, what, what happens. So all those three processes. And uh, ultimately also how their social relationships are, yeah, what impact this mm. um, practice has on the social relationships. Mm -hmm. It's quite tough. To yeah. Say. Well, it sounds like a huge amount you're doing. I mean, you're going in a lot of different, I mean, it's all around compassion, but it's really looking at a lot of different uh, aspects yeah. of it. Yeah, that's one of, one of my challenges, to be more focused. <laughs> <laughs> you're getting a little too, to, yeah, unfocused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's, that's, <laughs> 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 that's the mirroring, the physical. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing, you know, we were talking, I just think it was coming to me is, you know, we, we talked about um, our definitions of empathy and compassion. And one way I, I've liked to look at those is through metaphor, uh, is another way of kind of explaining uh, those experiences. And, you know, often empathy is, is actually defined as the metaphor of standing in someone else's shoes, looking through someone else's eyes. Uh, for me, empathy is like a cornucopia in that it's, it's like a door that opens this, yeah, it's a Norse, you know, metaphor, right? It's the, corn, the horn of plenty, this horn of emotional plenty that kind of happens as we kind of open up. And so I'm wondering, do you have a, a metaphor? You know, what is empathy like metaphorically uh, or what is compassion like metaphorically to you? I think that it makes you... It gives it you an opportunity to live the life more fully, more rich. Not, not just less pain, it could be painful also to try to be compassionate all the time because you feel maybe much more. But to live more rich and more full. Mm. Uh. So uh, it's not, it, that's kind of like more of a description, not quite a metaphor. My, I think my metaphor of a cornucopia is like maybe addresses that richness. You know, it's like the, me the cornucopia, everything comes out of the horn of plenty and you have the sense of richness and fullness, right? So do you have like an well, image of, of what that image. is like? It's sometimes it's hard for scientists to come up with these metaphors. I don't want to. I don't want to push you. I, I can, I even... I can produ I produce a short haiku. Uh, <laughs> okay. you no, know, you know, but going beyond my own borders, mm. trying to go be beyond my own borders. Okay, so open, empathy open and com yeah. oh, oh, open up. Uh, yeah. Going beyond the borders the, of a country or is there any, oh, yourself, your own yeah. borders. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. and, and is that the same for empathy and compassion or would you have different metaphors? Um, I, did, I, I interviewed a, a, a Buddhist monk uh, here and she's in Washington state and I asked her for a metaphor of compassion and she said it was like putting out fires. Right, we have fire within ourselves, the suffering, and then the suffering in others. And so the whole thing revolved around going and going to your neighbor, putting out their fire, putting out your own fire. That was her picture of what compassion was like. So are you seeing different metaphors for yeah, the two? If, yeah, if I say uh, open up borders, my borders could be empathy. Mm -hmm. And uh, compassion would be, yeah, go beyond the borders, uh, outside of myself or my comfort zone uh, in order to to be interested and maybe help someone else that that would be uh, compassion this alleviating suffering I think more yeah help someone else mm -hmm. help your brother and sister yeah 
I'm hearing a little bit of resistance to the the suffering <laughs> part of compassion, right? It's yeah. like you're you're wanting to redefine compassion as not just being about uh, suffering. You'd like to kind of expand that a little bit. Uh, is what I'm hearing. Is that? Well, that's going to be a tough one because it's in all the dictionaries and all the, I know. the books. It's like you're, you're really, that's why I like the word empathy better because I don't, I don't have to kind of fight those battles, you know, about redefining the word because empathy is by definition already a, a, has that broad um, experiential. It's like it's experiencing everybody's, any emotion, any intention, any move, you know, any physical experience. So. That, that's for me. That's one of the problems. Why I haven't really focused on compassion because uh, it, it's it's that suffering part, and you know. That's, if that's it, it, yeah. It's a bit um, depressive. Could be if you just focus on that all the time. Yeah. I think it's so interesting your your explanation of it. I have not heard that one before. So yeah, I learned a lot. Yeah. Well, I've been I've done, you know, 150, 170 of these interviews and I always ask about definitions. That's been me kind of putting the different pieces together, you know. It's it's like everybody's kind of looking at the perspective from a different perspective and it's like trying to how do we put all those together and so far that's the uh, the model that's kind of been working and I've been kind of testing it out on people too and so far it seems to be holding up, you know. Seems Can I ask you, how, what do you do for your living and what, wh where is the bread coming in? Um, well, right now, yeah, I just work here. This is the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, work out of the uh, home office. And um, so the, the income is, you know, I've just had uh, my inheritance, been using up my inheritance. Mm. <laughs> so it's been one of the things that has kind of been contributing. But I do want to, I'm really kind of focusing on the circles and uh, Lee Devine and I want to put together a teacher's training or facilitator's training. Oh. So we're going to be we're going to be setting up a whole uh, training uh, process. You know, be uh, holding workshops and be holding what we you know uh, circle uh, groups. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the World Cafe. Have you ever no, heard of that? Yeah. So this is very this is kind of based partially. You know, we're kind of taking ideas from everyone. And we're and part of it is the World Cafe, which is small groups. You can have a big, you know, a, uh, you know, maybe forty or a hundred people, but you break them into small group discussions. So it's a highly interactive and relational show. So we're going to be doing kind of workshops like that too. So that's what I hope. You know, we can kind of make the bread, as you call it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds really good. Yeah. yeah. So, well, that's it. That's also that the whole I've been as I've been exploring this is I see that there seems to be different entry ways into empathy and compassion, and one seems to be the contemplative route, and a lot of the compassion and seems to be the is the uh, you know the mindfulness, what's kind of coming out of meditation, out of Buddhism, which is a a really a you know a, a, a you know it seems to be kind of focused on the meditate meditative meditative kind of qualities and a focus and then there seems to be another route which is the relational mm -hmm. uh, route where you focus on people relating to each other and I've always been bored by by meditation I cannot sit still I'm sorry I can understand that. <laughs> it's like, it's tough. it is it's, I like dance you know being out yeah, there you know true. dancing being integrated and how do you you know so I, I see those two kind of routes so far. Do you see other routes that, uh, you know, broadly speaking in terms of? Well, we have this specific route for researchers, which we try to develop. But we, we try to use both of the other routes, but we use this, those both practices, meditation, contemplation, and movement and dance and mindful walking uh, in order to put our research in a global context and maybe hopefully in a compassionate way. So that could be an, a, a, a one special case which I th think could be developed much more. When you say that, are you saying that there's the contemplative, there's the relational and then there's kind of the inquiry kind yeah. of approach? Yeah. So yeah. that would be three 
methodologies, general methodologies that yes. were yeah. in, in kind of the broadest kind of a sense. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. So, well, this is great. Is there any, you know, we've gone, you know, going close to an hour and I wow. used to go for, for an hour. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really delightful. I, you know, I, 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 you know, I tend to wander all over the place with these dialogues. So I hope that's acceptable to you. I mean, it's been a real delight talking. Is there anything more that you feel, at least in, in this discussion, that you'd like to be sure that we cover? I think we covered a lot, and uh, I have a lot of what you say, blind spots still, and I think you showed me some blind spots which I could look more into and... Uh, I'm really curious about the circles. I really want to join and practice that. And I also look forward to, look, uh, to meet your colleague in, in London and the other researchers there, so it will be fun. Yeah. And also follow your work. Uh, and maybe if you come to Sweden sometime, 